Um, it's good to be together. This is uh, one of an ongoing series of public conversations in the Transformational Leadership Series. Tonight, we are so pleased to welcome Professor Russell Jung. Um, Professor Jung is a sociologist, a scholar of sociology of race and the sociology of religion and social movements. His current research examines the worldview of Chinese Americans, the most non-religious ethnic group in the United States, he writes. <laughs> Dr. Jung holds degrees, two degrees from um, Stanford University and a uh, PhD from Berkeley. He is, uh, that'll work, is that what you're saying? Yeah. Um, he's worked in China in the mayor's office of the city of San Francisco and since 2002 has been a professor at San Francisco State University's Asian American Studies Department. Dr. Jung is deeply engaged with his students in conducting community-based participatory research with Asian American communities. He's also served and lived in a low-income community in East Oakland, California for the past three decades. Reflections on some of those experiences are captured in the spiritual memoir, At Home in Exile, Finding Jesus Among My Ancestors and Refugee Neighbors. His most recent book, Family Sacrifices, the Worldviews and Ethics of Chinese Americans provides new ways of understanding the growing number of religious nuns and considers how the American church may be in decline. Have you noticed that the American church may be in decline? And how a decolonized Asian American Christianity might lead the way for the church in exile to be made more faithful and more pure. We've had a great start to our transformational leadership class, and we've talked about our own exile and our own places of crossing over. Um, and we're going to have a wonderful conversation tonight. Russell, we're so glad that you're here with us. Thank you, Bill. The title of the talk, at least, as uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the title of the of the conversation is "Exilic Justice: What My Refugee Neighbors Taught Me About Shalom in the City." So my sense is you're going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to be in conversation together a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, yeah, so if, if I can, I'd like to share a couple of stories with you to get the conversation rolling and to talk about um, my Asian American sense of social justice. And to start off, when I was flying out here to um, the East Coast, I had four and a half hours, so I used that time, because you know the coronavirus is really hot, right? And so um, I was reading every global news story about coronavirus and xenophobia. And so there were about 700 articles since it started, and I'm doing this content analysis. And so on the plane, I downloaded all those articles, and I was reading each of them, and I was coding them, and identifying the type of xenophobic activity, um, where it came from, what was the source. And so I spent four and a half hours doing this, and I'm typing it all in. And then when I got off the plane and then got to the hotel, I realized I didn't save it. <laughs> and I lost four and a half hours of work. And so I don't know if that's ever happened to you to do, to do all the sort of write a paper and then to lose it all. It's always better the second time, right? <laughs> yeah, but it's no. still painful. <laughs> no. And, and I just feel like, I don't know, that sense of loss and regret and anger and frustration. And I, I got a bit of good news, but it didn't even make me feel better at the same time. And, and then I thought, oh, this must be how, you know, to lose your work is really frustrating. And then, then I thought about, like, coming to give this talk on X, I was like, what would it be like to lose your life's work, mm. right? What would it be like to spend all your time building up a family business or even building up your family? to build a home and then to lose it. And how do you make sense of that? How do you <clears throat> lament and, and complain to God about that? How do you find meaning in that? And that's a sort of little taste of what I, I think of what in the, the last four years um, I've been experiencing since, the, since Trump got elected that the day I woke up, I realized this is not the America that I know. And now I'm in exile in my own home country. And what's it mean to suddenly feel like 
all along in the United States, I felt like I sort of belonged, I had a sort of power, I was with Obama, we were on the right track, and then to be derailed, right, by, unless you're a Trump supporter, to, to get back on the tracks. But um, for me, it was this great sense of, of disorientation, of, of, of feeling powerless, of feeling um, a lack of hopelessness. And um, there's all this stuff going on now that makes me even more anxious in this time of exile. And so um, the first part is that this climate change just grieves me, and I uh, ask for forgiveness for this generation and generations to come for what my generation did to the land and to the environment. And so that just sort of creates all this anxiety, right? And then the political context and even the political divisiveness in this country and the ideological battles, and um, that's really disheartening, right? And how do you deal with that? And there's all these sort of, you know, the Statue of Liberty says, give me your poor huddled masses. And there's all this mass stuff going on today, right? There's mass incarceration. And that's not just with African Americans, but it's the mass incarceration of families at the border. And, um, people being detained. Um, there's, ma there's mass man-made disasters because of global warming, right? These, these things, the wildfires in, in California, they're man-made and they're massive and um, we have mass deportation in my community. We have, um, you have mass shootings all across the country. You have mass, <clears throat> um, Boy, there's, um, there's so many things that, that make me feel out of control um, and disheartened. And then also to see the churches, at least in my, my what I see perceive like the American church as being sort of complicit in, this, in creating these problems or being apathetic to these problems. And so that gives me a real sense of where's our hope? How do I... Um, how do I handle, how do I see God in the midst of this? All right, so you're with me? Mm -hmm. Sorry to depress you guys. And um, I live in Oakland. Oh, that's the other thing. I live in Oakland, and where I'm living, there's mass displacement. Hmm. And um, people, uh, we work with refugees, and um, we used to have like 40 kids in our tutoring program, and 75% of those kids have had to move out because it's too expensive. They, so they've been massively displaced. They're like triple refugees moving out of their home and then moving to the camps and then moving to the US and getting resettled and now having to be unsettled again because they can't afford the Bay Area. Um, the people I have known for 30 years, they've become homeless themselves. And so we have mass tent cities in my neighborhood, um, blocks and blocks of people living in tents. And um, that's the context in which I live. And for me, what I've learned and actually where I find my hope, despite feeling exiled, are these other exiles that I'm surrounded by. The community that I've, I've come to love and live, they're the ones who's teaching me to how to have hope when you're powerless. And so being powerless and being displaced and being disoriented is sort of new for me and that, 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 that's my privilege and of my education and my class and my generational status. But I think I could learn a lot more from my refugee neighbors who, um, who take these things for, as an assumed, you know, you know, we talked about racism as just an assumed part of their lives. This displacement and this exilic status is part of their assumed life and how they understand and see God. And so I learn a lot from them. And I'm going to share you some of the lessons I've learned from them um, quickly, I guess. Um, so what happened where I was, I wanted to meet Jesus. Um, I, I grew up um, in an evangelical setting, and I did all the right pietistic things. I prayed, I had devotions, I went to Sunday school, I did Bible studies. Um, but I felt like I wanted to know Jesus in a deeper, different way, embodied way. And... So at one point, you know, I'm reading scriptures that said, blessed are the poor. And I went to, what, what's it mean? Why are the poor blessed, right? And it says, 
if you serve the least of these, you're serving me. And I go, well, what's that mean to actually meet Jesus in the midst of the poor? Or when Jesus told the rich young ruler, go sell everything and follow me, it wasn't this sort of like idea. Maybe he actually meant that to me literally, go sell everything, to the, give to the poor and follow me. I thought, oh, is that the way to meet Jesus in a different way? And so I, I didn't sell everything and follow Jesus and give to the poor, but I thought I'd do it for three months. <laughs> so it'd be like a test thing. I thought, okay, I'm going to live among the poor just for three months to see if I could meet Jesus, to understand why they're blessed, to see them as I serve, and to see if it's worth selling everything to follow Jesus in this context. And so I moved into East Oakland in this apartment complex called Oak Park Apartments, and it was half Cambodian refugees and half undocumented Latinos in the neighborhood called the Murder Dubs, because it's aptly named because it's the most robbed neighborhood in the most robbed city in the country. Um, and, and when I moved in, there was a high gang um, and drug going on. Um, so um, what happened quickly over the course of time is that <clears throat> I, 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 despite the violent surroundings and getting robbed several times and getting threatened by drug dealers, um, I loved it there and I really did meet Jesus through that community because they were so welcoming, they were so hospitable. You know, when you said if, um, when I was naked, you clothed me, when, you, <clears throat> um, when I was hungry, you fed me. I was that person because I needed to be fed by the Cambodian grandmas. Whenever I went to their homes, they, you know, their Asian hospitality, they assumed that I needed to be fed and they would stuff me with food. And so when I was poor and hungry and thirsty, they were the ones who served me and I met Jesus through them serving me. And so I loved it there. And um, so I could tell you stories about that, that, that sense of connection I had. But I loved it so much and I, met, I found like I found the treasure of great price that I would be willing to sell everything. So I, I didn't just stay for three months, I stayed for a decade hmm. with this community. And, um, and, I, and then I moved out and moved two blocks away. So I'm still in that community. And I just heard, one of the good news I heard was that I'm going to officiate the wedding of one of the Oak Park kids who grew up in it. So anyway, um, I'm living with the, this Cambodian Latino community over a period of time. We realized we're living in a slum and um, our, our landlord wasn't going to do anything to make things better. So we organized our, our neighbors and there's a whole big organizing effort that's uh, really God-driven because he actually unified the entire community and people stood up for their rights, right? And so um, the Oakland Tribune had a headline that said, um, <clears throat> shabby building forms unlikely coalition. And it was unlikely because those Cambodians who don't speak English, working with Latinos who don't speak English and a bunch of Christians living there who are like, what's this guy from Stanford living with these guys? And it was God who brought us together and we, they all stood up to sue our landlord. <laughs> And so that was, we got 200 of our neighbors to sue. Wow. It was pretty remarkable. And then, but what happened was that our landlord was smart and he went to, um, he declared bankruptcy. Right, so we had all these ups and downs and we, then the city condemned our building and we thought, oh, we destroyed our community. And that began our summer of prayer. We prayed a lot and then God intervened again. And um, in bankruptcy court, usually, the creditors are fighting to get over the, 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 the money. And so the landlord owed money to the city because of all the city fines. He owed money to his um, Fannie Mae, his mortgage. And he owed um, the tenants who were suing him. And so usually those parties would be fighting, but we actually worked together. And the city attorney's name was Johnny Angel. Hmm. And our landlord's name was Ken Evilsizer. <laughs> so we had Johnny Angel versus Ken Evilsizer. And we go to bankruptcy court and we actually win a settlement and the headlines read, um, we won a million dollars to spread among the community. But not only did we win a million dollars, but we got him to sell to a nonprofit huh. and it became permanent affordable housing. We got these really good, um, the nonprofit consulted with another nonprofit that did a lot of participatory tenant planning. So the, Tenants helped plan the reconstruction of New Oak Park. 
And so we have a community garden, we have a tenant activity center, we have solar panels, we had ambient heating on the floor. And so when, before people were getting sick because of the dilapidated buildings, it was a clear case of environmental racism because we were all getting sick and the landlord was being negligent. Now it's like, you know, the American dream. Because everybody had, they went from living in one bedroom apartments to like three bedroom apartments that were HUD. So I used to tell the story and everybody, oh, this is great, God's justice prevails, happy ending, and um, that's the end of our story. But then it's sort of like those Broadway musicals where what happens when they don't, what happens after, uh, happily ever after, mm -hmm. right? And um, what happened happily ever after is that the Christians had to move out because our incomes were too high, so that's why I moved out. And then um, the landlord was actually better at maintaining the property and so they had to evict some of the families that were drug dealing and doing wrong things. And so, and then um, even worse, what made the conditions even more barren and sad is that everybody began to retreat to their own private life. So that once families and kids got their own bedroom, they wouldn't go out to play anymore and socialize, but they would just stick to their devices and, and stay at home. So what was, used to be a vibrant ethnic communities where we would have large Cambodian New Year parties and barbecues, just became this sort of like typical American boring, dead suburb where people didn't connect. And now, in retrospect, the kids that grew up in Oak Park and I, we just sort of rue what happened, right? We won justice in that we won a lawsuit and had better health, but we lost our community. So it's a real ironic story. And it's, it's really paradoxical. And so now when I tell the story, people are like, no, that's not so fun. You know, like, <laughs> so I've, I've actually, it's a secret, I've learned to go to churches and just tell the happy story. I sell way more books than if I tell the real story and say it's like, oh yeah, in real life, life goes on and it's, it's like we destroy the community. So, so back then that really challenged me. I go, well, Gee, can we ever secure justice, right? Can't, and in the bigger context, there's all these structural factors that are capitalism that are displacing people. Gentrification is, you know, is just seems inevitable. Um, school segregation, you know, it's just sort of rational choices for middle class people to take their kids out of the schools. And so, I know, well, where's the hope? And so I'm gonna quickly tell you um, three lessons I got from Jeremiah 29 as interpreted, as interpreted by my refugee neighbor, um, Beck Chom. And I'll show you a picture of him because he was a Cambodian elder in our community who was a healer. And let me show you his picture just so you get a sense of, he's my neighbor who taught me how to find hope and justice in the neighborhood. So here you could pass this around. Yeah, it's a computer. <laughs> so Beth Tron. So in Jeremiah 29, you guys know the passage about, it's written to a bunch of people who are exiled in Babylon, and it's actually written to the second generation. So they've been there a long time already. And that, that remnant or those exiles in, in Babylon are trying to figure out, should we go back home or should we make our life here in Babylon, right? And a lot of people are saying, well, yeah, go back. And, and um, Jeremiah gives the sort of quizzical answer, no, settle down and make families, right, or be family and stuff like that. And I was like, what's, why would we want to settle down in the land of our exile, of our conquerors, right? Why would we want to be part of the empire? And I think that for a lot of the second generation, that's the question we're facing, is like, our families moved to the U.S. to get the American dream. We're sort of living the American dream, but how much do we want to celebrate and take part of that American dream when it's a nightmare for everybody else, Right? Why do we want to be part of a nation that's imprisoning kids on the border? Why do we want to be part of a nation that's imprisoning one out of three African-American men, right? Why, why do you want to be celebrating being 
a member of this kind of society. And so, uh, you know, <clears throat> that's what God, God said, settle down and be family. <clears throat> and I, I sort of wondered about that. And so Beck Chom sort of helped me understand that. I went to Beck Chom and said, you know, when we were starting the lawsuit, it was really hard for a lot of the Cambodians to join the lawsuit. And a lot of Latinos understood their rights, but Cambodians didn't understand that sense of rights. And a lot of the Cambodians were afraid of the government because the government killed them. So why did you join the lawsuit? And uh, Beck Chuam, you know, he looks like this, like, quiet, stoic, oriental Buddhist monk, but he really is a snarky joker guy. So I asked him, oh, why'd you join the lawsuit? And he started cracking at me, and he pointed at me, and he goes, I did it for you, Russell. <laughs> and I go, what are you talking about? You did it for me. And he said, you look so sorry going around knocking on everyone's <laughs> door and asking, can you sign this paper? <laughs> you look so pathetic that I, I did it for you. <laughs> I go, oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, but what I realized later is that um, he did it not Excellent. because he had this individual sense of rights that were wrong, but he did it out of a sense of I was his family. I was like his son or grandson, and he was being taking care of me and helping me. And so him um, being an elder to me, his responsibility was to just sort of support me and uh, that's what it meant to be family, is to take care of each other, to have that sense of corporate responsibility. And for me, I realized that God's call for exiles just to be family is an Asian way of doing justice, that being family means you take responsibility for each other. And you just, <clears throat> that's how you do justice. You treat each other like family. And so then, you know, in America, the sense of justice is when your rights are denied and you win back those rights. But for Beck Chuam, justice wasn't about individual rights being lost or won. It's whether you take responsibility for each other or not. So injustice occurs not when your rights are lost. Injustice occurs when people don't take responsibility for each other, right? It's a totally different kind of concept of justice. Injustice occurs when you don't be family to each other, when you don't have those right relations with each other. I go, wow, that's pretty deep, that Trump, you know? And, but for me, that, this notion of family, of learning how to be family, both in a um, communal context and in a societal context, is that even in the face of injustice, even in the face of exile, even in the face of hopelessness, you could still be responsible for each other. You can still have right relations for each other. And that's the first thing that he taught me as an exile. The second thing in Jeremiah said to do is um, to, um, I don't know, what does it say? Oh, seek and work for the shalom of the city, right? Just, just do what's, just go and make peace, do what's right. And I go, well, what if it doesn't work, right? I'm American, I want to be effective. I tried to work for justice at Oak Park and I screwed it up, right? And, and now today, even more activists are trying to like, how do we, they get angry when things don't go their way in like two years and so you get all burnt out and you have these bitter, angry activists. Um, so how can we keep on seeking and working for the shalom of the city when it doesn't come, right? And uh, so again, I go back to Beck Chom. It's like, why should I work for justice when I'm not effective at it? And so I, I'm asking Beck Chom, you know, um, there was a time in the lawsuit <clears throat> when our building got condemned and we were worried about always having to be um, to being scattered and being displaced again. I asked Beck Chom, what were you going to do, Beck Chom, when we were all afraid of being displaced? And again, he laughed at me. And he pointed to me again, he goes, I was going to live with you, Russell, in your great big house. And um, so again, he's being all snarky and sarcastic. Um, but for me, that answer was like, he didn't know what he was going to do, but he was going to just trust, um, trust in his community that it's the right thing to do and it's the family thing to do. So his response to 
to seeking peace in the city was that you just do it because it's the right thing to do mm. and it's the faithful thing to do, right? So we don't do things, <clears throat> um, fight for justice as exiles because we're going to bring about the justice ourselves. We do it because it's the right thing to do and it's a faithful thing to do. In of itself, the act of seeking peace is worth it. And God will bear the fruit, whatever that kind of fruit that is, um, whether it's fruit within us, a sense of patience and perseverance, a sense of calm and peace, or maybe it is actual concrete change, but it's not up to us to bear the fruit. It's if we trust that God will bear the fruit. And Beck Chom taught me how to, to live in trust. Mm. And then the last thing in Jerusalem uh, that Jeremiah said was um, to pray for the city. And Beck Chom was a Cambodian healer who, who really did do a lot of ritual prayer. And I realized that um, when the building was condemned, we prayed every morning. And <clears throat> we realized that um, for a lot of activists, um, prayer isn't doing anything. But I realized that by praying, that could be, that's the most active faith and work kind of thing to do. Because by praying, we're actually petitioning, by going to the courts, the high judge of heaven, and arguing and petitioning and advocating on behalf of our community. That prayer is an act of justice. It is doing justice because prayer is an active, um, conscious, willful, um, active thing to do. So, um, so that's, Beck Chuan taught me, no, you know, it's not all on you. You just bear fruit by doing what's right and if you pray to God, what more can, that's the best kind of advocacy you could ever have. So to wrap it up, Beck Trom's perspective of exile, of being powerless, taught me a different way of doing justice and seeking peace, right? In contrast to the American mainstream where it's fighting for your rights, um, Beck Trom taught me it's about being family. Instead of um, trying to be effective in making change and transforming the world, it's learning to trust and to, um, to do what's right. And instead of um, taking it on as a, um, something that we need to do, it's a doing justice means seeking God and his kingdom. So I've learned a lot from my neighbors and I could tell you more stories um, about what's going on in my community. That was 20, 30 years ago. We continue to live in that neighborhood and I continue, especially during this time of exile, of seeing the church decline, I still find hope in my neighbors. And um, we could talk more about um, now, along with refugees, we work with a lot of the unhoused neighbors and how do they live in their day-to-day -day, um, conditions of living outside? How do they find hope? and um, and then more recently, we have a transitional shelter in our neighborhood for, um, for reentry pris prisoners from re re what do you call it? Re entry prisoners in reentry. Anyway, a lot of the guys coming to our church are lifers. Post incarceration, you mean? Post yeah, 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 yeah. So these lifers actually murdered people when they were kids and were like, you know, sentenced to life, but eventually got paroled. And um, I'll tell you, uh, I'll, I'll let it be a cliffhanger and tell you what I've learned from my uh, life or friends. So thanks for listening. So, so um, oh no, don't clap yet, because we're going to now be in conversation. And, and I hope that you're going to have uh, some, some questions that you want to engage Russell about. So I'll just give you a minute to think about those. You, uh, you invited our class this afternoon by way of self-introduction to talk about some places that, well, in our own family histories, where we cross national borders, where we, uh, well, where we were really were in exile, mm -hmm. and what it what it meant for our family story to be in that place of exile. Mm -hmm. um, why'd you do that? Why why is it worth all of our thinking about that that place in our own lives, not just in the lives, as well as in the lives of other people? Um, why do we adopt an exilic identity? How would it be helpful? 
Um, again, I, I, say, I think it's useful because in the, um, if you fill out a sorts in this world with climate change or the political context, then you're in exile. You're, you're displaced and deracinated and uprooted and unsettled. So you have to learn to live with that exilic feeling of displacement. Um, I think it's also imperative for Christians because that's who we're called to be, to be, called, to be strangers and aliens in this world, right? So we're pilgrims in this. So how do we live lightly in this world? How do we become undefiled from this world? It's all by adopting an exilic pilgrim identity. Um, otherwise, you're just going to buy into the empire. You're going to assimilate into the empire's values, the lies, its um, trappings. You're going to eat the food of the empire instead of trying to stay away from it, and then that food's going to poison you. And so I think understanding how we're exiles, um, foreigners to this world and citizens of heaven, that's, that's a great identity to adopt. And so um, that's why we did this exercise to recognize, yeah, we are sort of have some sense of that worldly exilic condition, and then what's our... What's the theological sense of that exilic condition is what we were trying to get at. Mm -hmm. And then actually, as we, what I found in that class is as we shared our journeys of migration and story, we realized that we're all journeying together, right? That we're pilgrims and that exilic community has power, that exilic community has support, and that exilic community um, provides hope. So... I don't know, there's lots of reasons. You could ask these guys. <laughs> I think it's, it's important to be exiled. Okay, and one last point is, um, African Americans develop a theology of liberation because that was their context coming out of slavery. And we said Latinx are, are developing a theology of borderlands because the borders cross them and they have to deal with that lack of citizenship, the lack of, um, of cultures crossing them. And Asian Americans are developing a theology of exile because we've... All, we're a people of diaspora, a people of migration, a people with transnational connections. And so as the more we unpack it, the more we can bless each other, just the way we've been blessed by a theology of liberation. Does that answer your question? What, it does. No. What, what's this bring to mind for you? What, 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 do you want to, what do you want to explore? What question do you have? So you're talking about the tension between just maintaining your own family and your own self-care and then the, the broader community. And well, I think the danger of, of, of the idea of creating family for the possibility for it to be an insular thing, but then also the danger of, of just exercising or being a part of these other, other movements to create a lack of Yeah. Yeah, so we are sort of fractured and divide, have divided loyalties, and it's hard to negotiate 
all these competing demands of different communities, and then the whole idea of what community looks like and what people expect from that community um, can vary. And um, yeah, I think that the, it, just like exile, it's a continual journey and process that you can't get to a community and it's a fixed point and we're settled. That's why we, we, we talked about being settled in our class. It's like, can you ever have a settled community or is it always changing and moving and how do we need to continually give to that community to, to give it life? We have to continually give to that family to keep it, to keep it being a family. Or even we have to keep on home making, right? Because we talked about where do we get our sense of home? Well, it's what we intentionally give to it and pray about. Um, but I gotta, get, I gotta tell this one story about um, of solidarity that I like. Um, so at one point, <clears throat> while I was living at Oak Park, um, the drug stealers stole my computer. And it really ticked me off. Because you just give it away. Huh? You yeah. just pass it around. <laughs> well, it was like a laptop, and they went through our window, and it wasn't a drug, it was like one of those runner, so it was a kid, mm -hmm. right? He just snuck in. And the thing that, that burned me even more is that I saw him every day and because they'd always, you know, the drug dealers were always at the entrance of our, and they're sitting on our cars, and so I'd glare at them and they'd glare at me and so, you know, it was just really tense and stressful to, to live among your enemies. And um, so, um, and plus, you guys are grad students. If you lost your computer or you lost your phone, you guys would be sort of like lost forever, right? And so like you'd be looking at your nightstand in the morning and what am I looking at? You'd be looking at your palm all the time. <laughs> um, so I was really frustrated and angry and then word on the street was that um, I could buy my computer back. Mm. And so I go, well this is really cool. Not that I could buy my computer but that I got actually a word on the street, right? Because that, that sounds uh, like 90s cool and hip. And so I, yeah, I got a word on the street. And so, um, so the word on the street was that I could go to Roach and Roach could get my computer back. And Roach was this guy living kitty quarter to me. And he was living with George, a convicted manslaughter. So it's just sort of fun living next to a guy named Roach. So I go to Roach. And I go, hey, I, word on the street is I can get my computer back. He goes, yeah, OK, I, I'll get it for you. And um, so then he comes back to me and says, yeah, um, <clears throat> get me this much amount of money, and we'll get your computer back. I go, oh, this is sort of cool. This is like movies. So I call the police, right? And I say, hey, word on the street is I could get my computer back. And the, the police, like, they never have people contact them with good news. They never get to arrest anybody. So they said, we'll wire you. And then once we get the information, we'll, we'll arrest the guys. I go, oh, this is even more fun, you know, to like to be wired up. <laughs> so I make the deal, and I call the police back. And I go, OK, the eagle has landed, wire me up. <laughs> and the police said, oh, sorry, our police technician is gone for the week. And I started all whining and complaining. Go, well, if you want your computer back and you need it so badly, just buy it back. And I go, okay, yeah, okay, that makes sense. So, no more police in the deal. And so I get my cash, and I, then I think, oh, I'm not that street stupid. I'm bringing money in the middle of the night to a guy named Roach, right? Is that <laughs> smart? He could just take it from me. And so I tell the Cambodian guys, hey, we're down the streets. I could buy my computer back. The eagles landed. Can you watch me? Um, while I get my computer back. They can say, okay. So, but what happened is that, because they lived upstairs and they could see the parking lot where I was going to make the deal and they all had guns. And so that made sense for me to get their protection. So when the time had come, I went out, but the Cambodians didn't fully understand me when I asked to watch out for me. So instead of watching from the upstairs, they came out with me with their guns. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I got to do this. Well, <clears throat> David, you do this. <clears throat> Michael Jackson and beat it. How did he go out? <laughs> or with Billy Jean, you know, that walk? I'm like, with his hands and walking out with a bunch of guys behind him. Like West Side Story? Yeah, yeah, like West Side Story. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, exactly like that. Yeah. So you can picture me, it's like a video where I'm walking out like this, and I had a bunch of guys walking out in slow motion behind me, <laughs> walking out to meet Roach. And, so, <laughs> so, and then meanwhile, all the kids are going, hey, where are you going, Russell? And I go, get away from me. We're on the street. I could get you. <laughs> and then so finally, Roach is on the, uh, I'm leaning against my car, and um, I go, OK, um, where's my computer? And he goes, oh, sorry, I got fenced off already. 
And so my big story, my big CSI TV show, I was like, that's not, that's not a happy ending. And, but what I realized later is that in my community, everybody had my back, right? Everybody was supporting me. The, guy who, the manager who gave me the word on the street, Roach was willing to deal with the drug dealers for me. You know, the Cambodian guys came out with guns for me. And I was just sort of amazed by the support and sense of community and solidarity that, that they gave me. So another time, um, Kosa, who was one of the guys who came out, my car got broken into again, and I'm cleaning out the glass. It's like midnight. And Kosa comes out and starts cleaning the glass with me. I go, oh, thank you. You know, you're so hospitable. <laughs> he goes, don't be a burden. Stop it. And I don't want to be a burden. And he's, he's just sweeping up the glass for me, and he goes, oh, it's OK. We're all in this together, you know, just like Disney musical, high school <laughs> musical. I go, ah. Oh. That's how church community should be. It's all of us in this together, all having this common neediness. And our solidarity doesn't come from, it's just because we're humans living together. And um, that's why I love it there. That's why I'm still there, the, that connection and that community. And it's not always a super tight community. It's always, it's sort of fleeting and evanescent and, but um, it's still there. And so those ties, all of us talked about the ties that make us, um, they gave me those ties that connected me. Hmm. So you mentioned the word Asian a couple of times in your talk, but I don't see particularly what was Asian about the kiss and the king supporting each other, the family notion, the responsibility, all those kind of things. It seems to me fairly universal in the rest of the world. Maybe the kind of linear development Uh-huh. Yeah, <clears throat> um, we're not claiming like Asians have the only claim to family or community, um, or that the way we do family and community is unique to Asians. But there are some particularistics to that that I think could be a blessing to other people. Um, let me try to figure out one gifting that um, this exile community gave me to me. I think um, one sense of hospitality, one of the things that I liked, and maybe, again, maybe other communities have this too, but this is how the Cambodians loved me. Whenever I went to their homes, um, when like Westerners say, oh, um, um, you ask, how are you doing? And then, um, but the, the, instead of saying, <coughs> how are you doing? Or, Asians would say, sit down, right? It's like, why is that the first thing you tell people? But that's because they assume that since you're a traveler, you're tired, and they just assume you're tired, and they tell you to sit down, right? So they say, sit. So I sit. And then they bring me food and water. And it's not like, they don't ask you, do you want anything to drink? Would you like any food? They just give it to me, right? And so I get all this food. And it's because they assume my needs. They, you don't have to ask for it. You don't have to... Um, you don't get questioned, what do you want? It's not about your wants and needs. It's the people as taking assumption of, of your needs, right? And so they would feed me and serve me and tell me to sit, and I'd be sitting there forever just to be with them, right? And so that's, that's how they were. And so later, this, one of the grandmas passed away, and... Um, and um, her granddaughter came to me and said, here, and she gave me a bottle of water, and she said, Grandma would have wanted you to have this, and I just broke down because I knew that's how she loved me, is that assumption of needs. I don't know if that's, maybe, does every culture do this, but this is, I know, the, the way these Cambodian grandmas were hospitable to me. They, um, they assumed for me what I needed and anticipated um, my needs and loved me in that way. And so when, her, when the granddaughter said, here's the water represented all that outpouring of that grandma's love. And um, yeah, I don't know if that's 
But in our group, a lot of the Asians talked about this Asian style of hospitality. That's foods. I mean, it's not, again, not unique to Asians, but it is a particular way and had particular meanings for us. Um, and I have lots of other stories in the book about um, Asian love languages. So uh, quickly, there's five love languages in that book, and they're supposed to be universal love languages. You know what it, what it is, what those love languages are? Can you name some of them? Huh? Touch. Gifts. Yeah, amount of time. So there's, so there's, you know, there's five love languages, like affirmation, service, gifts, time. And then there's always that ethnic love languages, like I'll feed you adobo, right? Or I'll, I'll cook you adobo. That's my gift of love. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, um, one of, I, I think that there are those love languages, but um, there's two like Asian love languages that I think are pretty universal among Asians, and one is food, that Asians express their love through food, right? And that's why Asians ask, have you eaten yet? And then when you go away to college, they'll send you away with a rice cooker and 20 pounds of rice, and, um, because that's the, how they show their love in one way is food, right? The second way is by sacrifice. Um, parents, and this, this is the diasporic exilic thing, is like, you ask, how do you find meaning in your, in your suffering? And most first generation say, it's for my children, right? It's for the sake of my kids that I migrate and I endure and I persevere, I'm resilient and I keep on working despite my own sufferings, despite my own downward mobility because it's for the second generation. And so we see sacrifice as the ultimate act of love. And so those are the Asian love languages, sacrificing for others and feeding others. And really that helps us understand communion and the cross, right? Those are the love languages of God. He's going to give us a, a banquet. He sacrificed himself. And so I think the Asian love languages that aren't, nobody ever talks about in the five love languages, these two Asian love languages are, um, are how God loves us. And I think we understand God, God's love in that way. It's like, ooh, God's feeding me again. Thank you. you know? God's giving me a party. Thank you. God's sacrificing himself, just like mom. Another question. But good question, yeah. You mentioned in your story earlier that the community of pain justice basically lost the sense of like deeper community. Can you speculate how you think that movements of justice can obtain justice but also maintain like cohesion and community afterwards? And I don't know if it's just a function of the fact that like this building was built in a specific way or is it like something, I don't know, deeper? Yeah, I hate that question. Everybody always asks me, in retrospect, in hindsight, wh hindsight, what would you have done? I go, oh, I, who knows what you would, I would have done and how do you make things better? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't know. We just have to, that's, that's part of the exile journey, right? You only take one step at a time. You have no idea where you're going to be resettled. You're just trying to make it day by day. And so you just try to act faithfully on the journey day by day. And so, yeah, I, I, I don't know. If we'd be beating ourselves up if we kept on trying to figure out what could we have done. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm not, maybe some people are like that and they're more retro, you know, introspective. I, I don't like doing that because then I just, then I just feel bitter and <laughs> frustrated. I don't know. That's how I deal with the, all the anxiety and frustration, I have this quick memory of forgetting everything and I disassociate. And so it's very uh, adaptive, <laughs> being dumb and happy. So you've <laughs> talked a little bit about your, your, your study on the plane, the, 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 coronavirus. the racism and the coronavirus. Is this another time of exile? I mean, we, I, I think people are afraid Maybe it's just a, a, a bug, I don't know. But um, exile doesn't look so good from the, at the beginning place, no. maybe is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, and so um, is impending doom scarier yeah, yeah. than the doom you're actually going <laughs> to? <clears throat> the thing is, that's the privilege of Americans. It's like most of the world's already in exile and feeling the suffering and the 
hardship of, of, of lives in poverty without water or yeah. in war. And um, it's just developed nations who like, think, wait a minute, something's wrong, right? But um, most of the people live under polluted air and can't breathe. Most people have dirty water. And so, um, but yeah, this coronavirus, it, they, it could be really, really bad, right? Because it, the articles talk about the end of globalization, right? If people start cutting off migration and having these travel bans, if people start cutting off travel and air traffic, and we can't get goods from China, then we can't actually build our cars, right? That's like the whole world economy is sort of um, connected. And if, if China has to shut itself down or quarantine itself, if other countries start creating bans from the movement of people and things, it's like, where, where do we go, right? And, and then we all become self-protective, afraid of each other because someone could be sick. It, it, is, it could be scary. Um, but who, yeah. And so, um, I'm just, I, I think I'm just saying it's hard to see the, the lessons there. Ah, the lessons are, for me, what I'm sort of saying is that you could act out of xenophobia and fear, you could act out of panic and hysteria, you can act out of misinformation, or you could act out of empathy and love, that to realize there's an entire province locked down as fellow exiles, how do we love them? Mm -hmm. How do we empathize with them? How do we see their conditions of being trapped as part of our conditions too? So instead of acting out of fear and closing in, how do we open up and be in a place of need the way Jesus went to a place of need? Right? right? This is our opportunity okay. to be witnesses of the kingdom, not scared, healthy people, <laughs> but yeah. instead going to the, where, the, it's like, where's God? And if the church is there, that's where God is, right? And so if we're there, and if the church is already there, you know, the, the Wuhan Christians are amazing. So if you still read about and learn about how they're faithful and how they're serving and how they're caring for their neighbors, um, that's where God is. Uh-huh. So I, I never, I always ask, oh, where is God in this, you know, and how, how can you find meaning? And it's like, well, God's there because his church is there, his body's there. So, and if you go to the border, then Jesus is still there. If you go into the prison, Jesus is there. If you go into, um, wherever you go, that's where Jesus is. You bring him. I think we're going to close the evening by that feeding of one another, but it's going to be